Vaughn. Oh God, are you gonna catch it? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> okay, we'll try to do a good throw. Oh, you got it. Nice. Not a great, not a great throw. Yeah, they're good. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. I'm in the NYT Cooking Kitchen Studio. Today I'm showing you three different kinds of candy. Fudge, chewy caramels, and nougat. These are perfect for the holidays. They make fantastic gifts. And everyone always thinks about cookie making for the holidays, but this year, I think candy making is really a fun new project to learn about. It's all about taking the properties of sugar and manipulating it to get different textures and flavors. And so I'm just really excited to show you these recipes. They are maybe a little easier than you think. When I was developing these recipes, I went really deep into candy making. It is its own discipline with like its own set of rules, and all those rules revolve around sugar and the things that it can do. It really shows that just with a couple simple ingredients, you can make a wide variety of different candies. And I love candies for the holidays because unlike cookies, they're super easy to package, they're portable, you know, you can make a whole bunch, wrap them up, they look really festive, and it's just something as a nice alternative to holiday cookies this year. I want to show you how I prep the pans for all of the the different kinds of candy. I have a square of parchment paper here, although you don't need a piece quite this large. You just need a piece large enough that can fit inside the pan with a little bit of overhang. So I actually like to find the midpoint of the square. So then I set my pan right in the center. So I have kind of the same amount going all the way around. Then I mark with the corners. You can mark it with like a pen or a pencil. I'm just making like a little cut at the four corners. Then what I do is I fold in both directions, like on lines connecting the four corners basically. So like there's connecting that corner and that corner all the way around. So that corner and that corner. And these are my guides. So now I have my guides. These lines here going out to each of the corners is where I'm gonna cut. Paring knife in there. So you can see what I've done is I've taken out like a square from each of the corners. And now the whole thing fits really snugly and evenly into the bottom of my square pan. And I actually grease the pan first because that helps the parchment to stick and stay in place. So that just makes it easier to fill the pan. And I tend to take my time here and get it really smooth, eliminate all the air bubbles. Again, it's just so that when you go to like unmold the candy and cut it, it's just really smooth and even. Fudge is a kind of crystalline candy. So even though when we eat fudge, it's smooth and creamy, it actually is crystallized, but those crystals are very, very small. And so the whole fudge making process is about creating those really fine crystals so that we have this smooth, creamy fudge. The main substance of fudge is sugar. And so everything else that I do to make fudge besides ensuring that creamy smooth texture is to balance out all of that sweetness. So I am using unsweetened chocolate and unsweetened cocoa powder. Plus I'm using two cups of walnuts. Having like a toasty savory nut in there is also gonna help balance everything out. Also have all of your ingredients ready to go because with candy making, you need to really pay close attention at every stage of the process. So it's not the kind of thing where you know, if your sugar is cooking, you, you don't want to walk away. You want to have everything ready to go. So the order of operations is really important. So I have an oven on 350. I want to toast these nuts. So I have two cups of walnuts. These are going to go into the oven. While my nuts are toasting, I'm going to do the first step of the recipe, which is to melt together my chocolate and butter. I have a large, heavy saucepan here. You want to cook in something that has like thick walls and is heavy duty because that's going to promote even cooking. So I'm gonna use the saucepan to cook the fudge. But for now, I just have a little bit of steaming water in it. It's on low heat. And I'm gonna use this as a double boiler first to melt together my chocolate and butter. So this is gonna go in. I'm using glass mostly because so you can sort of see what's going on, but um, a metal bowl will melt a little bit faster. Maybe you caught the souffle episode um, where we did the exact same thing. This setup is called a double boiler. I'm just using it to gently melt this mixture. So you don't want the water rapidly boiling. You just want a little bit of steam to warm everything slowly. This will finish melting. I'm gonna grab the walnuts. Those are done toasting. I give them a smell. They smell like really toasty. I forgot the most important thing you're gonna need for this recipe. Well, you need everything, but you especially need a candy thermometer. 
So if you have a really high quality, like digital instant read thermometer, you can use that. But I, for fudge, I think particularly the best thing is a candy thermometer. A candy thermometer will mark certain candy stages. So there's softball, soft crack, hard crack. We'll talk about all of those. Um, and it comes with a clip, so it like fits onto the side of a bowl or a pot. So you'll definitely need one of these. So next I have all of my ingredients for the sugar mixture. I'm going to empty out and dry the saucepan because this is where I'm gonna cook the fudge. For my other fudge ingredients, I have two cups of sugar. This is not really the time to use like a, you know, like a natural unrefined sugar, just white table sugar. Then I have a quarter cup of cocoa powder. If your cocoa powder is very lumpy, you probably want to sift it. All right, so one cup of milk. It's gonna go in. I have two tablespoons of honey. Honey is a type of invert sugar, basically. So it's liquid at room temperature. And using an invert sugar helps to maintain the moisture in the fudge. Fudge can dry out really, really easily. It also helps to prevent crystallization at this stage. Again, it's not really there for flavor. It is there for its kind of chemical properties. And ditto corn syrup. It is going to prevent crystallization and keep everything kind of moist. I'm gonna stir this over just medium heat to start. So this is going to start to come together. I wanna to dissolve that sugar. In the meantime, make sure you have everything else ready to go. So I have a large bowl for transferring the mixture. I have another bowl with cold water. That's important, I'll talk about why. Then I have a smaller bowl just filled with water for my pastry brush. And then of course my candy thermometer. So it's really important that you have your mise en place ready, all of your, not just ingredients, but equipment ready to go. So my sugar is dissolved and it's now just starting to come to a simmer. So I'm getting some light bubbling around the sides. And so it's at this stage before I get that rolling boil that I wanna brush down the sides. So this step is to dissolve any little sugar bits that are crystallized around the side of the pan. So this is really important because any cr crystals that are stuck around the sides could cause a chain reaction and cause the entire mixture to crystallize. Again, fudge is all about controlling crystallization and we don't want it to happen at this stage. So now it's coming up to a rolling boil. I'm going to clip the candy thermometer to the sides. So it has this little clip here, you can move that down. It also has like a little foot at the bottom because you don't want the bottom of the thermometer to be touching the bottom of the saucepan because you won't get an accurate reading that way. And I wanna cook this until it reaches what's called softball stage. Now this is, there's some variability here. So what's softball in my kitchen, on my thermometer, on my stove, in you know, certain weather might not be softball in your kitchen, on your stove, and in your weather. So that's why I have this bowl of cold water here. And this mixture is just going to bubble away. It is going to reduce, so right now it's pretty high in the saucepan. As the moisture is driven off, it will reduce down. So softball is a sugar stage. Candy making is the basic process of dissolving sugar and then cooking it to the particular stage that you desire. So softball is one of those stages and it's at a certain temperature, which is another way of saying it's another, a certain concentration of sugar. It's where you'll, you achieve sort of those chewier textures from, from candy versus like a hard crack, which is obviously like it kind of shatters. You'll see why it's called softball. I'm literally gonna show you because it makes like a softball in water. As it approaches softball, which is 238 to 240, I'm going to reduce the temperature and that's so that I don't like, you know, shoot right past it because I'm blasting it with so much heat. And when it hits 238, I'm gonna start my softball test. You don't wanna stir because stirring can promote crystallization at this phase, but what you can do is swirl. So swirling helps to equalize the temperature and make sure that the thermometer is getting like an equal reading. All right, I'm gonna do my first softball test. So I'm gonna spoon out a little bit of the mixture into this bowl. Then I'm gonna give it, I, I can already tell, I don't think it's there. So after a few seconds of cooling down, you should be able to pull it out of the bowl and it should hold its shape. So if you were to roll it into a ball, it should be able to hold that shape without flattening out too much. Like it's a little bit soft and then you should be able to squeeze it between your fingertips. So I'm a little bit shy of softball. I'm gonna go another degree or two. So now I'm at 240, I'm gonna do it again. I could see that it looks different going into the bowl. I can just already kind of tell. So I, I'm at softball now. So now I can form a sphere that pretty much holds its shape, but it easily flattens between my fingertips. Immediately turn off the heat and take out my candy thermometer and transfer this mixture into a large clean bowl. So I'm gonna just pour this in. 
but I'm not going to scrape the bottom or sides because scraping the bottom or sides means that I might get like an errant sugar crystal into the bowl and then crystallization will happen when I don't want it to and I'll have a grainy fudge. So, and now I want to add my melted chocolate mixture. And I'm going to scrape this in, but I'm not going to stir it. If you were to stir now, while the mixture is very hot, you'll get very large sugar crystals. So now, and this is really the key to making fudge, is we are going to let this mixture cool down. So I'm going to wash off my candy thermometer, just get it clean, dry it off, and then I'm going to put it in the bowl, and I'm going to watch the temperature kind of drop down from where it is now to 115 Fahrenheit. Depending on the temperature of your kitchen, it could take like 30 to 40 minutes. It's pretty cool in here, so I suspect it'll be on the lower end of that. So our fudge mixture has been cooling for about 30 minutes, and the temperature has steadily dropped. I'm at like 119 right now, so just almost at 115. I have my hand mixer fitted with the beaters, and it's at this stage that we are going to crystallize the fudge, and that constant agitation with the hand mixer helps to break up the crystals into really, really fine pieces so that we have a smooth, not grainy fudge. I am at 115. Oh my god. Sorry, I, I realized I was looking at the wrong, at the wrong temperature gradation. I'm at 115, and this is great. Okay, you can see that it has already thickened it as it has cooled. So now I'm going to go in with my hand mixer. This is the one that, this is the hand mixer that like goes crazy at the beginning. Okay, so this mixture is quite thick. Your hand mixer is going to struggle a little bit to, to beat this, but it's much better to use a hand mixer than doing it by hand. You can do this completely by hand. In fact, I've seen candy makers do it on a, on a big marble slab with like a spatula. That's another way to do it. So I have my mixture, my hand mixer at medium low. It's like getting caught in the beaters, but it will kind of like smooth out and come back into the bowl. So I'm not going above medium low speed for a couple of reasons. One, I don't need to like air it. I don't need to like work really a lot of air into it. I just want to constantly agitate it. So the speed isn't particularly crucial. Um, but also like you can hear the hand mixer, it's struggling a little bit. The mixture is really thick. So I just don't want to like push it further than I already am. All right, I'm nearly there. This has gone quite quick. This has gone very fast. I would describe the change that occurs. It gets a little bit more opaque and lightens in color a little bit. It almost has kind of a creamy look to it. I think I just broke your hand mixer. There's smoke coming out. There is. <laughs> it, <laughs> it won't turn on. Hold on, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do the rest by hand. At least I'm near. I'm near that end point. I'm just going to agitate my hand. I'm really close. Oh my God, sorry guys. I'll send you a hand mixer. Sorry, New York Times. <laughs> this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Oh my God. So it has nearly lost its shine. I'm very close to it having more of that like satiny finish. I'm looking pretty creamy. It's also thickened up. All right, I'm there. So you can, there's definitely a texture change that has occurred. So I'm going to quickly scrape off my beaters. Now, you want to work quickly because it can set really fast at this point. I'm going to fold in my toasted nuts. So my nuts are well incorporated. And now everything is going to get scraped into my prepared pan. <laughs> I also broke a spatula at home doing this. It is thick. OK, so that goes in. And I just want to get it in an even layer. And then that's it. This looks great. I'm really happy with how this turned out. One thing you can do with the overhang of the parchment is you can fold it down. And then you can really sort of press on the surface with your hands to get it into an even layer. Because at this point, it's quite firm. OK, I have the fudge pressed into the pan in an even layer. It's still a little bit warm, so I'm going to set it aside. It is going to cool completely at room temperature and set during that time. So you want to give it at least a few hours to set fully. And then we're going to cut it. And we're going to make two more <laughs> kinds of candy. There's several different methods for making a soft caramel. Often what you see is a recipe that uses condensed milk, and you add it to the sugar, and you cook the whole thing up to a certain temperature, and that's it. However, I add sort of a step into the process. I'm making a fresh dairy caramel, so I have heavy cream right here. That tends to increase the cook time a little bit because I'm trying to drive off more, more moisture, but I like the flavor. And I also do a two-part cooking process where first I caramelize just the sugar, and then I add the dairy and cook it again. 
And the reason I do this is because I think it develops a lot more of the kind of bittersweet caramel flavors. And I really like that because that bitterness that you get from developing like a really dark caramel helps to balance out all the sweetness. So in terms of equipment, again, I'm using a candy thermometer. I have that same eight inch square pan lined and greased exactly the same way as I did before for the fudge. A fine mesh strainer and a rolling pin. I have the rolling pin because I'm using an optional ingredient here which is coffee beans. So I'm using the coffee beans to infuse the cream that I'm adding to that caramel mixture. And infusing it with the coffee adds of course like great coffee flavor and to me it adds like another level dimension of bitterness that offsets some of the sweetness. So the first step is to infuse the cream. It's going to go into a small saucepan. Then I have half of a vanilla bean and I'm going to use the tip of my paring knife to split the bean open. But I'm not cutting all the way through, I'm just kind of making like a slit along the skin on one side. Then I open it up, basically like unzipping it, and then put my finger at the stem end and then I use the flat side of the knife and scrape down the length. So this is removing all of the seeds. And now I'm gonna stick the pod, which still has a great flavor, and all of the seeds into the saucepan. So next, I'm going to crush up my coffee beans. So I'm starting with whole beans. It's about a third of a cup. So I put them in a bag. And I'm going to break them up. I'm kind of lightly bashing them. Like, I don't want them ground. I just want them kind of cracked. The reason I'm doing it this way rather than just calling for coarse ground coffee is coarse ground coffee can mean a lot of different things. And I want the pieces big enough that I can strain them out with a strainer and I don't get coffee grinds in my caramels. It already smells so good. Okay, so I'm going to infuse this. So I wanna bring this up slowly over medium heat, just to a simmer. Heating up the cream has a couple purposes. One, it, of course, it helps to infuse the cream with the coffee and vanilla flavor. But I also want the cream warm when I add it to my sugar mixture because I don't wanna cool down the sugar mixture rapidly because I'm just gonna cook it again. And if you add cold cream, to like hot caramel, the caramel can harden and seize and it doesn't ruin it. You can always re-dissolve it and bring it up again, but it's just much easier to start with cream that's already warm. Chewy caramels, unlike fudge, are a non-crystalline candy. So with fudge, we are re-crystallizing the mixture, but controlling how that happens so that we get really, really fine crystals so that it reads very smooth. Caramels, on the other hand, are non-crystalline. So at no point is the sugar going to re-crystallize um, so the process of making soft caramels is all about preventing crystallization at every stage. God, candy's hard to explain. I'm like really, it's like a lot. <laughs> it's time to cook my caramel mixture. So my cream is just hanging out. Now in a large saucepan, I'm going to combine my granulated sugar, a third of a cup of water. So we're cooking what's called a wet caramel, which means I am dissolving the sugar in water first and then bringing it up. So again, corn syrup, which is basically glucose, is there to prevent crystallization. So when you're making a caramel, when you're making a wet caramel, you want to stir only in the very beginning as the sugar is dissolving. Once it's dissolved and at a boil, that's when you stop stirring because stirring can encourage crystallization. So if you have like an undissolved sugar crystal in there and you're stirring and agitating like we did with the fudge, basically what happens is you can set off a chain reaction where the whole mixture crystallizes. Um, and then you get, it goes grainy and you never really get caramel, so that's what we want to prevent. I've mostly dissolved the sugar, so I'm going to stop stirring. It's starting to bubble a little bit around the sides, so it's about to come to a boil. And now I'm going to start to wash down the sides because I can see that I have some stuck on crystals. And I'm not submerging the pastry brush in the mixture. I'm kind of going right to the, to the level where it starts. And you'll see the, the crystals basically disappear. So I'm not using a candy thermometer for this stage. At this point, I'm trying to make a caramel and I'm just going by color. So I like to cook my caramel to a pretty dark color. I usually describe it as like a dark amber. Caramel is sort of one of those things where it doesn't seem like anything's happening until it happens and then it goes fast. In the beginning, you'll notice that the bubbles look more like like boiling water bubbles. And as that water concentration drops and the sugar con concentration goes up, the bubbles will kind of transform. They get bigger, they're slower to pop, and they have kind of a glassy look to them. So that's kind of how you know that caramelization is near. And swirling helps to just equalize the temperature. I have a pretty high flame under it. Once you start to see caramelization occur is when you want to back off the heat a little bit and start to turn it down because like this mixture retains heat and it will continue to cook even after you basically take it off the heat. So I like to moderate the heat so I can be really, I can be in control of the color. 
as it starts to take on color, you'll notice that the mixture will actually start to bubble less and less because there's at, like, at, that, at a certain point, there's absolutely no water left in it. And you'll also notice that it becomes a little bit more fluid. So now I'm at like a medium golden color. It's kind of the color of honey. It's getting really close. There's little wisps of smoke that are coming out. So I know that I'm on my way. I'm at probably a medium amber right now. So I'm going to remove it from the heat. So this color is looking really nice. And now I'm going to add my butter. So I'm just gonna add it in pieces. And take care because it will sputter. There is moisture in the butter that immediately is going to sort of cook off. So I'm adding a little bit at a time. Stir with a heat proof spatula. So I wanna stir until that is completely melted and the mixture is smooth. And now I'm going to strain in my cream mixture. So I have a mesh strainer right here. So I'm gonna pour this infused cream into my strainer. So you can see it's sputtering quite a bit. Again, it's that, it's that moisture in the cream that is being cooked out. It smells so good. It smells like coffee. Okay, so I'm just kind of pressing on the solids to release all of that cream. Be mindful of your hands because this is obviously generating steam, so this gets a little bit hot. So I'm gonna stir until this mixture is very well combined and that cream is incorporated. <laughs> Is this fogging up the lens a little? Here, you know what I'll do? I'm gonna move this onto the burner. So it's gotta go in and then I'll give it a... So now we have our caramel mixture with all of that dairy in it. I'm gonna bring it back up to a boil. And at this stage, because we've added that moisture and everything is dissolved, it's okay to stir a little bit. I'm not gonna constantly agitate it, but I am gonna give it a little bit of a scrape around the sides and bottom just to prevent any kind of sticking or burning. And now it's back up at a boil. I'm gonna clip my candy thermometer to the side of the pot. So my salt goes in as well. So there's a bit of a range for caramels. It depends on kind of the texture that you're going for. If you like a softer caramel, that's gonna be like very melt in your mouth, then I would cook it to 250. If you want a slightly firmer caramel that's gonna have a little bit more of a chew, I would go to 255. I kind of prefer the firmer caramel because when you cut it, you get like nice sharper edges. Um, and I just like that chewier texture. So I'm gonna go to 255. So right now it's at it's nearly at 240, so I have a little bit of a ways to go. And you can occasionally, if you're worried about the mixture overcooking, especially if your pot is like kind of on the thin, flimsy side, you can just give it a little bit of a stir. I'm at 255, so now I want to immediately remove it from the heat and pour it into my prepared pan. So again, as for the fudge, I'm not scraping the bottom or sides. So you can see that mixture goes in, it's quite bubbly. As it cools, it's gonna settle. And I have some flaky salt right here, which I'm gonna use to top my caramels, except I'm gonna wait for it to set a little bit. So at this point, it's still really liquid. And what happens is that salt kind of like disappears into the surface. So I want it to still be hot because I want the salt to stick, but not so hot that it just kind of like sinks in. So about 10 or 15 minutes, and this is the finishing touch, and then that's it. Our third type of candy that I'm making is nougat. So it's similar to marshmallows, which is also egg white based. And it basically consists of streaming like a sugar solution into egg whites as you're whipping. So nougat is the trickiest of the three types of candy. There's no point really during any of the candy making process where you can like hit pause once you start cooking stuff. Um, but it's particularly important for nougat that you like have your wits about you and you're paying attention and you're making sure that everything is timed just right. So I have two and a half cups of pistachios here. I'm gonna toast them really well, and that's gonna add all of the kind of like nutty toastiness to offset the sweetness of the nougat. So as I mentioned, this is an aerated, like egg white based confection. So I have three large egg whites right here. Room temperature, room temperature egg whites whip more easily and faster than cold. Make sure you're working in a really clean mixing bowl. My salt and one tablespoon of granulated sugar in my stand mixer. Then into my small saucepan, I'm going to add my honey. Then in my second saucepan, I'm combining the sugar, a quarter cup of water, one little tip. Often I add the water first, actually, and I think that helps to prevent crystallization around the sides. But if you add the sugar first, I add it to the center of the saucepan, and then I kind of pour the water around the sides of it, which again helps to prevent crystals from forming around the saucepan. Then my corn syrup, I have three tablespoons. So the first step now 
once you have all of your ingredients in their correct location, is I'm going to bring the honey to a boil. So while the honey is coming up, I am going to also put my sugar mixture over, I would say medium heat. And I don't really want to start cooking this, but I do want to kind of start to warm it up to start to dissolve the sugar. Nougat making, even more so than other candies, is a little bit of a dance with very specific choreography. So we're cooking the honey to a certain temperature and streaming it into the egg whites. Then we're cooking the sugar to a different temperature and streaming that into the egg whites. And you want them to be pretty much like in as rapid succession as you can manage. It's okay if there's a little bit of a pause between, but they're sort of like you're sort of simultaneously working on both mixtures. All right, so the honey is starting to come up to a boil. So I have my clean candy thermometer. And make sure you're using a small saucepan because it's not very much honey. You need a small saucepan, otherwise that candy thermometer can't really reach into the honey to give you a temperature reading. This is where the choreography really starts because I want to stream my honey mixture right when it hits 248 into my egg whites, but I have to whip the egg whites first. So they need to really be at medium peaks in order for, to incorporate the honey, otherwise it won't whip up. So when this hits around 235, which it's there right now, I'm gonna to start to whip these. And I wanna get these to medium peaks. So I'm gonna turn this up. Okay, so I'm actually, I'm nearly there. I'm at about 247. So I'm gonna remove this from the heat. Hold on to your candy thermometer because I'm gonna use it for my sugar solution. And when I have medium peaks, I'm gonna stream this in. So I'm gonna kind of pour it into the bowl, avoiding the whisk. Pour slowly. You wanna slowly bring up the temperature of the egg whites. Okay, so that's all of the honey. This mixture is now quite hot. So I'm gonna continue to beat this on medium high speed until the mixture is warm but not hot. So that'll take a few minutes. And in the meantime, I am going to start to boil and cook my sugar solution. So this is nearly at a boil. So the mixture is basically dissolved. So I can get this over like medium high again. So as this mixture is coming up to a boil, I'm gonna do that same technique that I showed you on the other two candies, which is to wash down the sides of the saucepan with a wet pastry brush. And now that this is coming up to a boil, I can clip my candy thermometer to the side again. It's okay if there is like a residue of honey on the thermometer, that's not that big of a deal. So I'm gonna clip this to the side. And this mixture, I'm actually cooking quite hot. I'm gonna take this all the way up to 310 degrees. And as that's cooking, keep an eye on your egg white mixture. You can always turn it off and just let it hang out while your sugar syrup finishes coming up to temp. 310 is past hard crack. So like you're, you're basically making a very, very concentrated sugar solution here that is going to add like tons of structure to the egg whites. So you wanna be particularly careful and mindful of your cooking on the sugar solution because if you let it go too far, it will start to caramelize. Like once it gets past 310 is when you start getting into caramel. And also make sure you're doing lots of swirling so that you can equalize the temperature if you do start to get any caramelization. I'm almost at 310. So I'm gonna turn on my mixer to medium high. Okay, so I'm at 310. And now, same technique. I'm going to stream this into my nougat. And I'm aiming for that place right where the egg white mixture meets the bowl and not aiming for the whisk. You can see how the egg whites have gotten like super voluminous, really glossy. The hard part's over, you did great. So that, that's the most sensitive part of this process. So now I'm going to continue to beat this mixture. You can turn it up to high. And I wanna go until, again, the mixture is warm but not hot. And it's gonna look like super fluffy and it's gonna get really, really thick. You might hear the mixture straining a little bit against the mixture. If you need to, you can like give it a rest and then turn it back on again. But this is gonna get very, very thick. So you can see we have this like very thick, dense, fluffy mixture. Looks so good. Now I'm going to add my vanilla and my melted coconut oil. And this is going to really transform the texture. It's going to look like the mixture is going to separate when I start to mix this in, but it will eventually will come back together. Like it gets kind of stringy and like the you know, pieces kind of break off, but you'll see that it will incorporate. It also deflates the mixture a little bit, so that's normal. Okay. 
So the last step is to fold in my pistachios. So I'm just folding all of this together to incorporate the nuts and get them evenly coated and mixed in. And now into the prepared pan. I want to spread this in an even layer, working it all the way to the corners. Try not to form any like big air pockets. This is going to set at room temperature. It takes several hours to set, so it's really best to actually just leave it overnight at room temperature, um, and then we'll come back and we'll cut it. The fudge has set up really nicely. I'm gonna pop it out of the pan. I also have a batch that I made yesterday using hazelnuts. I'm gonna cut both. You can use the edges of the parchment to help you pop it out. Okay, so when you're cutting your fudge, you can really choose the dimensions, but I think you wanna cut it into fairly small pieces because it is really rich. So I wanna show you a little cross section. So you can see it's not grainy at all. It's not crystallized. It has a nice, firm, sliceable texture. This fudge got a little bit firm. This fudge stayed a little bit softer, so I'll show you kind of the two textures. If you find that you make a batch that turns out like this one and you want it to be a little softer like this one, what you can do is just cook it a degree or two less um, when you're testing that softball stage and you'll get a little bit of a softer texture. So here we have the walnut fudge cooked a little bit more, agitated a little bit more, and this is the hazelnut fudge cooked a little bit less, agitated a little bit less. So this has a little bit more of like a soft texture and this one is a little bit more just firm. And you can also notice the color difference. This one's a little bit lighter and a little more matte. This one is a little bit darker with a bit more of a sheen. But both are delicious, so I'm gonna taste the walnut version. Great chocolate flavor and it has that like wonderful creamy texture that I really love. When I think, when people think of fudge, I think this is what they think of. It's a very, very classic chocolate fudge. I made this batch of caramels last night. I wrapped it really well in plastic just to prevent it from pulling moisture from the air and getting sticky. These I cooked to 255, so this is a bit of a firmer caramel. If you made softer caramels, like, and you only took it to 250, you might want to chill the whole slab for about 15 minutes before you slice it because you'll be able to get sharper, nicer cuts that way. I think this is really like my ideal texture where it is soft and chewy, but you can still slice it and get like a really clean cut. I did taste a little piece, and I have to say, they're so good. I mean, I love the texture. It has the perfect chewiness. It's that mix of like, you can chew on it and then it kind of starts to melt. And the coffee flavor comes through. It's not just bitterness, it is like, a wonderful coffee aroma that mingles with the caramel really, really well. Delicious. Because these are sticky and will start to fuse back together, I like to wrap them individually. I have some wax paper. You can also use, there's like pre-cut little foil wrappers for candy, which are great. Wrap it lengthwise and then twist the ends, just like that. The final candy to cut is our nougat. Because this is a slightly softer nougat, I went ahead and chilled it. That's just gonna make it easier to cut. I knew that I liked fudge, and I definitely knew that I liked caramel. I didn't know how much I liked nougat until I really started testing the recipe. So I'm gonna do thirds in one direction. Okay, so I'm gonna separate them a little bit. And as you can see, it's fairly sticky, so I am going to then wrap each one in a little bit of wax paper. So I love that beautiful slice with those toasted pistachios in there. Cut up a little piece. Like the first thing I get is honey, then I get the toasted pistachio. It's kind of a special candy, and I think it's something that people do not think they can make at home, but really I think it's worth the effort. Sugar is amazing. I know it gets a bad rap, but if you're making and eating candy, then we have to celebrate sugar because it can make everything from fudge to chewy caramels to this cloud-like marshmallowy nougat. There's really a kind of a wide world of candy making and confectionery, and this is just a little bit of it, but I think this stuff is really approachable at home. You can toast the nuts in like a toaster oven and just do everything on the stove, so I hope you enjoyed watching. It's been really fun to bring you episodes of Try This at Home, and I hope you try this at home. Happy holidays.